What's up guys, in this video we're going to introduce the concept of client-side artificial neural networks, which will lead us to deploying and running models along with our full deep learning applications in the browser. To implement this cool capability, we'll be using TensorFlow.js, TensorFlow's JavaScript library, which will allow us to, well, build and access models in JavaScript. I'm super excited to cover this, so let's get to it. Whether you're a complete beginner to neural networks and deep learning, or you just want to up your skills in this area, you'll definitely want to check out all the resources available on the Deep Lizard YouTube channel as well as deeplizard.com. There, you'll find several complete video series and blogs where you'll learn everything from absolute machine learning basics all the way to developing and deploying your own deep learning projects from scratch. Here's a quick breakdown of the sections that make up this video. Go ahead and take a look here to get an idea of the content we'll be covering together. So client-side neural networks, running models in the browser. To be able to appreciate the coolness factor of this, we're going to need some context so that we can contrast what we've historically been able to do from a deployment perspective to what we can now do with client-side neural networks. All right, so what are we used to being able to do? As we've seen in our previous series on deploying neural networks, in order to deploy a deep learning application, we need to bring two things together, the model and the data. To make this happen, we'll normally see something like this. We have a front-end application, say a web app running in the browser, that a user can interact with to supply data. Then we have a back-end application, a web service, where our model is loaded and running. When the user supplies the data to the front-end application, that web app will make a call to the back-end application and post the data to the model. The model will then do its thing, like make a prediction, and then it will return its prediction back to the web application, which will then be supplied to the user. So that's the usual story of how we bring the model and the data together. And we've already gone over all the details for how to actually implement this type of deployment, so be sure to check out that series I mentioned earlier if you haven't already. Links in the description. Now, with client-side neural network deployment, we have no backend. The model isn't sitting on a server somewhere waiting to be called by front-end apps, but rather the model is embedded inside of the front-end application. What does this mean? Well, for a web app, that means the model is running right inside the browser. So in our example scenario that we went over a couple moments ago, rather than the data being sent across the network or across the internet from the front-end application to the model in the backend, the data and the model are together from the start within the browser. Okay, so this is cool and everything, but what's the point? For one, users get to keep their data local to their machines or devices, since the model's running on the local device as well. If user data isn't having to travel across the internet, we can say that's a plus. And there's more on this concern in the previous series I mentioned. Additionally, when we develop something that runs in a front-end application, like in the browser, that means that anyone can use it. Anyone can interact with it as long as they can browse to the link our application is running on. There's no prerequisites or installs needed. And in general, a browser application is highly interactive and easy to use, so from a user perspective, it's really simple to get started and engage with the app. So this is all great stuff, but just as there's considerations to address with the traditional deployment implementation, there are a couple caveats for the client-side deployment implementation as well. But don't let that run you off. There's just a few things to consider. As we're talking about these, I'm going to play some demos of open source projects that have been created with TensorFlow.js, just so you can get an idea of some of the cool things we can do with client-side neural networks. Links to all of them are in the description. Now, onto the caveats. For one, we have to consider the size of our models. Since our models will be loaded and running in the browser, you can imagine that loading a massive model into our web app might cause some issues. TensorFlow.js suggests to use models that are 30 megabytes in size or less. To give some perspective, the VGG16 model is over 500 megabytes. So what would happen if we tried to run that sucker in the browser? We're actually going to demo that in a future section, so stay tuned. All right, then what types of models are good to run in the browser? Well, smaller ones. Ones that have been created with the intent to run on smaller or lower powered devices like phones. And what types of models have we seen that are incredibly powerful for this? Mobile nets. 
So we'll also be seeing how a mobile net model holds up to being deployed in the browser as well. Now, once we have a model up and running in the browser, can we do anything we'd ordinarily otherwise do with a model? Using TensorFlow.js, pretty much. But would we want to do everything with a model running in the browser? That's another question, and the answer is probably not. Having our models run in the browser is best suited for tasks like fine-tuning pre-trained models or most popularly, inference. So using a model to get predictions on new data. And this task is exactly what we saw with the project we worked on in the Keras model deployment series using Flask. While building new models and training models from scratch can also be done in the browser, these tasks are usually better addressed using other APIs like Keras or standard TensorFlow in Python. So now that we have an idea of what it means to deploy our model to a client-side application, why we'd want to do this, and what types of specific things we'd likely use this for, let's get set to start coding and implementing applications for this in the next sections of this video. Let me know in the comments if you plan to follow along, and I'll see you in the next section. In this section, we'll continue getting acquainted with the idea of client-side neural networks. And we'll kick things off by seeing how we can use TensorFlow's model converter tool to convert Keras models into TensorFlow.js models. This will allow us to take models that have already been built and trained with Keras and make use of them in the browser with TensorFlow.js. So let's get to it. TensorFlow.js has what they call the Layers API, which is a high-level neural network API inspired by Keras. And we'll see that what we can do with this API and how we use it is super similar to what we've historically been able to do with Keras. So given this, it makes sense that we should be able to take a model that we built in Keras or that we trained in Keras and port it over to TensorFlow.js and use it in the browser with the Layers API, right? Otherwise, the alternative would be to build a model from scratch and train it from scratch in the browser. And as we discussed in the last section, that's not always going to be ideal. So having the ability and the convenience to convert pre-built or pre-trained Keras models to run in the browser is definitely going to come in handy. All right, now let's see how we can convert a Keras model to a TensorFlow.js model. First, we need to install the TensorFlow.js model converter tool. So from a Python environment, probably one where Keras is already installed, we run pip install TensorFlow.js from the terminal. And once we have this, we can convert a Keras model into a TensorFlow.js model. There are two ways to do the conversion, and we'll demo both. The first way is making use of the converter through the terminal or command line. We'd want to use this method for Keras models that we've already saved to disk as an H5 file. If you've watched the Deep Lizard Keras series, you know we have multiple ways we can save a model or save parts of a model, like just the weights or just the architecture. To convert a Keras model into a TensorFlow.js model though, we need to have saved the entire model with the weights, the architecture, everything, in an H5 file. Currently, that's done using Keras model.save function. So given this, I already have a sample model I've created with Keras and saved to disk. If you don't already have access to these Keras model files, don't worry. I've included links to Keras GitHub where you can just download these files. Once you have them, you can follow this conversion process using those H5 files when they're needed later in this video. I'm in the terminal now where we'll run the TensorFlow.js converter program. So we run TensorFlow.js converter and specify what kind of input the converter should expect. So we supply dash dash input format Keras. Then we supply the path to the saved H5 file and the path to the output directory where we want our converted model to be placed. And the output directory needs to be a directory that's solely for holding the converted model. There will be multiple files, so don't just specify your desktop or something like that. So when we run this, we get this warning regarding a deprecation, but it's not hurting us for anything we're doing here. And that's it for the first method. We'll see in a few moments the format of the converted model. But before we do that, let's demo the second way to convert a Keras model. This is going to be done directly using Python, and this method is for when we're working with a Keras model and we want to go ahead and convert it on the spot to a TensorFlow.js model without necessarily needing to save it to an H5 file first. So we're in a Jupyter Notebook where we're importing Keras in the TensorFlow.js library, and I'm going to demo this with the VGG16 model because we'll be making use of this one in a future section anyway but this conversion will work for any model you build with Keras. So we have this VGG16 model that's created by calling keras.applications.vgg16.vgg16. 
And then we call tensorflowjs.converters.saveKeras model. And to this function, we supply the model that we're converting, as well as the path to the output directory where we want the converted TensorFlow.js model to be placed. And that's it for the second method. So let's go check out what the output from these conversions look like. We're going to look at the smaller model that we converted from the terminal. So we're inside of this directory called simple model, which is the output directory I specified whenever we converted the first model. And we have a few files here. We have this one file called model.json, which contains the model architecture and metadata for the weight files. And those corresponding weight files are these sharded files that contain all the weights from the model and are stored in binary format. The larger and more complex the model is, the more weight files there will be. This model was small, with only a couple dense layers and about 640 learnable parameters. But the VGG16 model we converted, on the other hand, with over 140 million learnable parameters, has 144 corresponding weight files. Alright, so that's how we can convert our existing Keras models into TensorFlow.js models. We'll see how these models and their corresponding weights are loaded in the browser in a future section when we start building our browser application to run these models. I'll see you there. In this section, we'll go through the process of getting a web server set up to host deep learning web applications and serve deep learning models with Express for Node.js. So let's get to it. To build deep learning applications that run in the browser, we need a way to host these applications and a way to host the models. So then, really, we just need a way to serve static files. If you followed the Deep Lizard YouTube series on deploying Keras models, then you know that we already have a relatively easy way of hosting static files, and that's with Flask. Flask, though, is written in Python, and while it would work perfectly fine to host the TensorFlow.js applications we'll be developing, it makes sense that we might want to use a JavaScript-based technology to host our apps since we're kind of breaking away from Python and embracing JavaScript in this series. So, enter Express for Node.js. Express is a minimalist web framework very similar to Flask, but is for Node.js, not Python. And if you're not already familiar with Node.js, then you're probably wondering what it is as well. Node.js, which we'll refer to most of the time as just Node, is an open source runtime environment that executes JavaScript on the server side. See, historically, JavaScript has been used mainly for client-side applications, like browser applications, for example. But Node allows us to write server-side code using JavaScript. We'll specifically be making use of Express, to host our web applications and serve our models. So let's see how we can do that now. First things first, we need to install Node.js. I'm here on the downloads page of Node's website, so you just need to navigate to this page, choose the installation for your operating system, and get it installed. I've installed Node on a Windows machine, but you'll still be able to follow the demos we'll see in a few moments, even if you're running another operating system. All right, after we've got Node installed, we need to create a directory that will hold all of our project files. So we have this directory here I've called TensorFlow.js. Within this directory, we'll create a subdirectory called local server, which is where the express code that will run our web server will reside. And we'll also create a static directory, which is where our web pages and eventually our models will reside. Within this local server, we create a package.json file which is going to allow us to specify the packages that our project depends on. Let's go ahead and open this file. I've opened this with Visual Studio Code, which is a free open source code editor developed by Microsoft that can run on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. This is what we'll be using to write our code, so you can download it and use it yourself as well, or you can use any other editor that you'd like. All right, back to the package.json file. Within package.json, we're going to specify a name for our project, which we're calling TensorFlow.js, all lowercase per the requirements of this file. We'll also specify the version of our project. There are some specs that the format of this version has to meet, but most simplistically, it has to be in an x.x.x format, so we're just going to go with the default of 1.0.0. All right, name and version are the only two requirements for this file, but there are several other optional items we can add, like a description, the author, and a few others. We're not going to worry about this stuff, but we are going to add one more thing, the dependencies. This specifies the dependencies that our project needs to run. 
We're specifying Express here since that's what we'll be using to host our web apps, and we're also specifying the version. Now, we're going to open PowerShell, and we have the ability to open it from right within this editor by navigating to View, and then Integrated Terminal. And you should have the ability to open the terminal of your choice that's appropriate for your operating system if you're running on Linux, for example, and don't have PowerShell. Otherwise, you can just open a terminal outside of the editor if you'd like. All right, so from within PowerShell, we make sure we're inside of the local server directory where the package.json file is. And we're going to run npm install. npm stands for Node Package Manager, and by running npm install, npm will download and install the dependencies listed in our package.json file. So let's run npm install, and we'll see it installs Express. And when this is finished, you can see that we now have an added node modules directory that contains the downloaded packages, and we additionally have this package lock.json file that we didn't have before. It contains information about the downloaded dependencies. Don't delete these things. All right, so at this point, we have node, we have express. Now we need to write a node program that will start the express server and will host the files that we specify. I see that makes sense. To do this, we'll create this file called server.js. Inside of server.js, we first import express using require express. Using require like this will import the express module and give our program access to it. You can think of a module in Node as being analogous to a library in JavaScript or Python, just a group of functions that we want to have access to from within our program. And then we create an Express application using the Express module, which we assign to app. An Express app is essentially a series of calls to functions that we call middleware functions. Middleware functions have access to the HTTP request and response objects, as well as the next function in the application's request response cycle, which just passes control to the next handler. So within this app, when a request comes in, we're doing two things. We're first logging information about the request to the terminal where the Express server is running. And we then pass control to the next handler, which will respond by serving any static files that we've placed in this directory called static that's right within the root directory of our TensorFlow.js project. So in our case, the middleware functions I mentioned are here and here. Note that the calls to app.use are only called once, and that's when the server is started. The app.use calls specify the middleware functions, and calls to those middleware functions will be executed each time a request comes into the server. Lastly, we call app.listen to specify what port Express should listen on. I've specified port 81 here, but you can specify whichever unused port you'd like. When the server starts up and starts listening on this port, this function will be called, which will log this message letting us know that the server is up and running. All right, we're all set up. Let's drop a sample HTML file into our static directory, then start up the Express server and see if we can browse to the page. We're going to actually just place the web application called predict.html that we created in the Keras deployment series into this directory as a proof of concept. So we place that here. You can use any HTML file you'd like though to test this. Now to start Express, we use PowerShell. Let's make sure we're inside of the local server directory and we run node server.js. We get our output message letting us know that Express is serving files from our static directory on port 81. So now let's browse to localhost, or whatever the IP address is that you're running Express on, port 81 slash predict.html, which is the name of the file we put into the static directory. And here we go. This is indeed the web page we wanted to be served. We can also check out the output from this request in PowerShell to view the logging that we specified. So good, we now have Node and Express set up to be able to serve our models and host our TensorFlow.js apps that we'll be developing coming up. Give me a signal in the comments if you were able to get everything up and running, and I'll see you in the next section. In this section, we're going to start building the UI for our very first client-side neural network application using TensorFlow.js. So let's get to it. Now that we have Express set up to host a web app for us, let's start building one. The first app we'll build is going to be similar in nature to the Predict app we built in the Flask series with Keras. 
Recall, this was the app we built in that previous series. We had a fine-tuned VGG16 model running in the backend as a web service, and as a user, we would select an image of a cat or dog, submit the image to the model, and receive a prediction. Now, the idea of the app we'll develop with TensorFlow.js will be similar, but let's discuss the differences. Can you see the source code that's generating the responses? Um, yeah, we can and we will, but first know that our model will be running entirely in the browser. Our app will therefore consist only of a front-end application developed with HTML and JavaScript. So here's what the new app will do. The general layout will be similar to the one we just went over where a user will select an image, submit it to the model, and get a prediction. We won't be restricted to choosing only cat and dog images though because we won't be using fine-tuned models this time. Instead, we'll be using original pre-trained models that were trained on ImageNet, so we'll have a much wider variety of images we can choose from. Once we submit our selected image to the model, the app will give us back the top five predictions for that image from the ImageNet classes. So which model will we be using? Well, remember how we discussed earlier that models best suited for running in the browser are smaller models, and how TensorFlow recommends using models that are 30 megabytes or less in size? Well, we're first going to go against this recommendation and use VGG16 as our model, which is over 500 megabytes in size. Nice priorities. We'll see how that works out for us, but you can imagine that it may be problematic. No worries though, we'll have MobileNet to the rescue, coming in at only about 16 megabytes. So we'll get to see how these two models compare to each other performance-wise in the browser. It'll be interesting. All right, let's get set up. From within the static directory we created last time, we need to create a few new resources. We need to create a file called predictwithtfjs.html, which will be our web app. Then we also need to create a file called predict.js, which will hold all the JavaScript logic for our app. Then we need a directory to hold our TensorFlow.js models. So we have this one, which we're calling tfjs models. Navigating inside, we have two subdirectories one for MobileNet and one for VGG16, since these are the two models we'll be using. Each of these directories will contain the model.json and the corresponding weight files for each model. Navigating inside of VGG16, we can see that. To get these files here, I simply went through the conversion process in Python of loading VGG16 and MobileNet with Keras, and then converting the models with the TensorFlow.js converter we previously discussed. So follow that earlier section to get this same output to place in your model directories. All right, navigating back to the static directory, the last resource is this ImageNet class JS file. This is simply a file that contains all the ImageNet classes, which we'll be making use of later. You can also find all of these ordered ImageNet classes on the TensorFlow.js blogs at deeplizzard.com. Let's open it up and take a look at the structure. So we just have this JavaScript object called ImageNet classes that contains the key value pairs of the ImageNet classes with associated IDs. All right, now let's open the predict with tfjs HTML file and jump into the code. We're starting off in the head by specifying the title of our web page and importing the styling from this CSS file. For all the styling on the page, we'll be using Bootstrap, which is an open source library for developing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that uses design templates to format elements on the page. Bootstrap is really powerful, but we'll simply be using it just to make our app look a little nicer. Now, Bootstrap uses a grid layout where you can think of the web page having containers that could be interpreted as grids, and then UI elements on the page are organized into the rows and the columns that make up those grids. By setting the elements class attributes, that's how Bootstrap knows what type of styling to apply to them. So given this, that's how we're organizing our UI elements. Embedded within the body, we're putting all the UI elements within this main tag. You can see that our first div is what's considered to be a container on the page. And then within the container, we have three rows and each row has columns. The columns are where our actual UI elements reside. Our UI elements are the image selector, the predict button, the prediction list, and the selected image. We'll explore this grid layout interactively in just a moment, but first let's finish checking out the remainder of the HTML. All that we have left to do is import the required libraries and resources that our app needs. First, we import jQuery. 
Then we import TensorFlow.js with this line. So this single line is all it takes to get TensorFlow.js into our app. Then we import the ImageNet class.js file we checked out earlier. And lastly, we import our predict.js file, which as mentioned earlier, contains all the logic for what our app does when a user supplies an image to it. All right, so that's it for the HTML. Let's check out the page and explore the grid layout. First, we start up our Express server, which we learned how to do in the last section. Then in our browser, we'll navigate to the IP address where our Express server is running, port 81, predict with tfjs.html. And here's our page. It's pretty empty right now because we haven't selected an image, but once we write the JavaScript logic to handle what to do when we select an image, then the name of the selected image file will be displayed here. The image will be displayed in the image section. And upon clicking the predict button, the predictions for the image from the model will be displayed in this prediction section. If we open the developer tools by right clicking on the page and then clicking inspect, then from the elements tab, we can explore the grid layout. Let's expand the body, then main, then this first div that acts as the container. And hovering over this div, you can see that the blue on the page is what's considered to be the container or the grid. So now that we've expanded this div, we have access to all the rows. So hovering over the first row, we can see what that maps to in the UI from this blue section. And we can do the same for the second and third rows as well. Then if we expand the rows, we have access to the columns that house the individual UI elements. So hovering over this first column in the first row, we can see that the image selector is here. And the predict button is within the second column in the first row. And the same idea applies for the remaining elements on the page as well. So hopefully that sheds a bit of light on the grid layout that Bootstrap is making use of. All right, in the next section, we'll explore all of the JavaScript that handles the predictions and actually makes use of TensorFlow.js. I'll see you there. In this section, we'll continue the development of the client-side deep learning application we started last time. So let's get to it. In the last section, we built the UI for our image classification web app. Now we'll focus on the JavaScript that handles all the logic for this app. We'll also start getting acquainted with the TensorFlow.js API. Without further ado, let's get right into the code. Recall in the last section, we created this predict.js file within the static directory, but left it empty. This file now contains the JavaScript logic that handles what will happen when a user submits an image to the application. So let's look at the specifics for what's going on with this code. We first specify what should happen when an image file is selected with the image selector. When a new image is selected, the change event will be triggered on the image selector. And when this happens, we first create this file reader object called reader to allow the web app to read the contents of the selected file. We then set the onload handler for reader, which will be triggered when reader successfully reads the contents of a file. When this happens, we first initialize the data URL variable as reader.result, which will contain the image data as a URL that represents the file's data as a base64 encoded string. We then set the source attribute of the selected image to the value of data URL. Lastly, within the onload handler, we need to get rid of any previous predictions that were being displayed for previous images. And we do this by calling empty on the prediction list element. Next, we get the selected file from the image selector and load the image by calling read as data URL on reader and passing in the selected image file. We then instantiate this model variable and we're going to define it directly below. Now, this below section may look a little freaky if you're not already a JavaScript whiz. So let's see what the deal is. Here we have what's called an IIFE or immediately invoked function expression. An IIFE is a function that runs as soon as it's defined. We can see this is structured by placing the function within parentheses and then specifying the call to the function with these parentheses that immediately follow. Within this function, we load the model by calling the TensorFlow.js function tf.loadmodel, which accepts a string containing the URL to the model.json file. 
Recall from the last section we showed how the model.json file and corresponding wait files should be organized within our static directory that's being served by Express. We're first going to be working with VGG16 as our model, so I've specified the URL to where the model.json file for VGG16 resides. Now, tf.loadmodel returns a promise, meaning that this function promises to return the model at some point in the future. This await keyword pauses the execution of this wrapping function until the promise is resolved and the model is loaded. This is why we use the async keyword when defining this function, because if we want to use the await keyword, then it has to be contained within an async function. Now, I've added a progress bar to the UI to indicate to the user when the model is loading. As soon as the promise is resolved, we're then hiding the progress bar from the UI, which indicates the model is loaded. Before moving on, let's quickly jump over to the HTML we developed last time so I can show you where I inserted this progress bar. So here we are in predictwithtfjs.html, and you can see that right within this first div, the container, I've inserted this row where the progress bar is embedded. We'll see it in action within the UI at the end of this video. All right, jumping back over to the JavaScript, we now need to write the logic for what happens when the predict button is clicked. When a user clicks the predict button, we first get the image from the selected image element. Then we need to transform the image into a rank four tensor object of floats with height and width dimensions of 224 by 224, since that's what the model expects. To do this, we create a tensor object from the image by calling the TensorFlow.js function tf.fromPixels and passing our image to it. We then resize the image to 224 by 224, cast the tensor's type to float32, and expand the tensor's dimensions to be of rank 4. We're doing all of this because the model expects the image data to be organized in this way. And note that all of these transformations are occurring with calls to functions from the TensorFlow.js API. All right, we have the tensor object of image data that the model expects. Now, VGG16 actually wants the image data to be further pre-processed in a specific way beyond the basics we just completed. There are transformations to the underlying pixel data that need to happen for this pre-processing that VGG16 wants. In other libraries like Keras, pre-processing functions for specific models are included in the API. Currently though, TensorFlow.js does not have these pre-processing functions included, so we need to build them ourselves. We're going to build a pre-processing function in the next section to handle this. So for right now, what we'll do is pass in the image data contained in our tensor object as is to the model. The model will still accept the data as input, it just won't do a great job with its predictions since the data hasn't been processed in the same way as the images that VGG16 was originally trained on. So we'll go ahead and get this app functional now, and then we'll circle back around to handle the pre-processing in the next section and insert it appropriately then. All right, so a user clicks the predict button, we transform the image data into a tensor, and now we can pass the image to the model to get a prediction. We do that by calling predict on the model and passing our tensor to it. Predict returns a tensor of the output predictions for the given input. We then call data on the predictions tensor, which asynchronously loads the values from the tensor and returns a promise of a typed array after the computation completes. Notice the await and async keywords here that we discussed earlier. So this predictions array is going to be made up of 1000 elements, each of which corresponds to the prediction probability for an individual ImageNet class. Each index in the array maps to a specific ImageNet class. Now, we want to get the top five highest predictions out of all of these since that's what we'll be displaying in the UI. We'll store these top five predictions in this top five variable. Top five, top five, top five. Before we sort and slice the array to get the top five, we need to map the prediction values to their corresponding ImageNet classes. For each prediction in the array, we return a JavaScript object that contains the probability and the ImageNet class name. Notice how we use the index of each prediction to obtain the class name from the ImageNet classes array that we imported from the ImageNet classes JavaScript file. We then sort the list of JavaScript objects by prediction probability in descending order 
and obtain the first five from the sorted list using the slice function. Lastly, we iterate over the top five predictions and store the class names and corresponding prediction probabilities in the prediction list of our UI. And that's it. Let's now start up our Express server and browse to our app. All right, we're here and we've got indication that our model is loading. So I paused the video while this model was continuing to load and it ended up taking about 40 seconds to complete. Not great. It may even take longer for you depending on your specific computing resources. Remember though, I said we'd run into some less than ideal situations with running such a large model like VGG16 in the browser. I warned you, now you will pay. So the time it takes to load the model is the first issue. We've got over 500 megabytes of files to load into the browser for this model, hence the long loading time. All right, well, our model is loaded, so let's choose an image and predict on it. Hmm, about a five second wait time to get a prediction on a single image. <laughs> Again, not great. Oh, and yeah, the display prediction isn't accurate, but that doesn't have anything to do with the model size or anything like that. It's just because we didn't include the pre-processing for VGG16, remember? We're going to handle that in the next section. There, we'll get further exposure to the TensorFlow.js API by exploring the tensor operations we'll need to work with to do the pre-processing. All right, so we've got that coming up, and then afterwards we'll solve all these latency issues attributed to using a large model by substituting MobileNet in for VGG16. Let me know in the comments if you were able to get your app up and running, and I'll see you in the next section. In this section, we're going to explore several tensor operations by pre-processing image data to be passed to a neural network running in our web app. So let's get to it. Recall that last time we developed our web app to accept an image, pass it to our TensorFlow.js model, and obtain a prediction. For the time being, we're working with VGG16 as our model, and in the previous section we temporarily skipped over the image preprocessing that needed to be done for VGG16. We're going to pick up with that now. So we're going to get exposure to what specific preprocessing needs to be done for VGG16, yes. But perhaps more importantly, we'll get exposure to working with and operating on tensors. We'll be further exploring the TensorFlow.js library in order to do these tensor operations. All right, let's get into the code. We're back inside of our predict.js file, and we're going to insert the VGG16 preprocessing code right within the handler for the click event on the predict button. We're getting the image in the same way we covered last time, converting it into a tensor object using tf.fromPixels, resizing it to the appropriate 224 by 224 dimensions, and casting the type of the tensor to float32. No change here so far. All right, now let's discuss the pre-processing that needs to be done for VGG16. This paper, authored by the creators of VGG16, discusses the details, the architecture, and the findings of this model. We're interested in finding out what pre-processing they did on the image data. Jumping to the architecture section of the paper, the authors state, quote, the only preprocessing we do is subtracting the mean RGB value computed on the training set from each pixel. Let's break this down a bit. We know that ImageNet was the training set for VGG16, so ImageNet is the data set for which the mean RGB values are calculated. To do this calculation for a single color channel, say red, we compute the average red value of all the pixels across every ImageNet image. The same goes for the other two color channels, green and blue. Then, to pre-process each image, we subtract the mean red value from the original red value in each pixel. We do the same for the green and blue values as well. This technique is called zero centering because it forces the mean of the given dataset to be zero. So we're zero centering each color channel with respect to the ImageNet dataset. Now, aside from zero centering the data, we also have one more pre-processing step not mentioned here. 
The authors trained VGG16 using the CAFE library, which uses a BGR color scheme for reading images rather than RGB. So as a second preprocessing step, we need to reverse the order of each pixel from RGB to BGR. All right, now that we know what we need to do, let's jump back in the code and implement it. We first define a JavaScript object, mean ImageNet RGB, which contains the mean red, green, and blue values from ImageNet. We then define this list we're calling indices. The name will make sense in a minute. This list is made up of one-dimensional tensors of integers created with tf.tensor1d. The first tensor in the list contains the single value 0. The second tensor contains the single value 1, and the third tensor contains the single value 2. We'll be making use of these tensors in the next step. Here we have this JavaScript object we're calling centered RGB, which contains the centered red, green, and blue values for each pixel in our selected image. Let's explore how we're doing this centering. Recall that we have our image data organized now into a 224 by 224 by 3 tensor object. So to get the centered red values for each pixel in our tensor, we first use the TensorFlow.js function tf.gather to gather all the red values from the tensor. Specifically, tf.gather is gathering each value from the zeroth index along the tensor's second axis. Each element along the second axis of our 224x224x3 tensor represents a pixel containing a red, green, and blue value in that order. So the zeroth index in each of these pixels is the red value of the pixel. After gathering all the red values, we need to center them by subtracting the mean image net red value from each red value in our tensor. To do this, we use the TensorFlow.js sub function, which will subtract the value passed to it from each red value in the tensor. It will then return a new tensor with those results. The value we're passing to sub is the mean red value from our mean image net RGB object, but we're first transforming this raw value into a scalar object by using the tf.scalar function. All right, so now we've centered all the red values, but at this point, the tensor we've created that contains all of these red values is of shape 224 by 224 by 1. We want to reshape this tensor to just be a one-dimensional tensor containing all 50,176 red values. So we do that by specifying this shape to the reshape function. Great, now we have a one-dimensional tensor containing all the centered red values from every pixel in our original tensor. We need to go through this same process now again to get the centered green and blue values. At a brief glance, you can see the code is almost exactly the same as what we went through for the red values. The only exceptions are the indices we're passing to tf.gather and the mean image net values we're passing to tf.scalar. At this point, we now have this centered RGB object that contains a one-dimensional tensor of centered red values, a one-dimensional tensor of centered green values, and a one-dimensional tensor of centered blue values. We now need to create another tensor object that brings all of these individual red, green, and blue tensors together into a 224 by 224 by 3 tensor. This will be the pre-processed image. So we create this process tensor by stacking the centered red, centered green, and centered blue tensors along axis 1. The shape of this new tensor is going to be of 50,176 by 3. This tensor represents 50,176 pixels, each containing a red, green, and blue value. We need to reshape this tensor to be in the form that the model expects, which is 224 by 224 by 3. Now remember at the start we said that we'd need to reverse the order of the color channels of our image from RGB to BGR. So we do that using the TensorFlow.js function reverse to reverse our tensor along the specified axis. Lastly, we expand the dimensions to transform the tensor from rank 3 to rank 4 since that's what the model expects. Whew! Okay, now we have our pre-processed image data in the form of this pre-processed tensor object. So we can pass this preprocessed image to our model to get a prediction. Before we do that though, note that we handled these tensor operations in a specific way and a specific order to preprocess the image. It's important to know though that this isn't the only way we could have achieved this. In fact, there's a much simpler way through a process called broadcasting that could achieve the same process tensor at the end. You gotta be kidding me. 
don't worry, we're going to be covering broadcasting in a future section. But I thought that for now, doing these kind of exhaustive tensor operations would be a good opportunity for us to explore the TensorFlow.js API further and get more comfortable with tensors in general. Checking out our app using the same image as last time, we can now see that the model gives us an accurate prediction on the image since the image has now been processed appropriately. Now, I don't know about you, but tensor operations like the ones we worked with here are always a lot easier for me to grasp when I can visualize what the tensor looks like before and after the transformation. So in the next section, we're going to step through this code using the debugger to visualize each tensor transformation that occurs during pre-processing. I'll see you there. In this section, we're going to continue our exploration of tensors. Here, we'll be stepping through the code we developed last time with the debugger to see the exact transformations that are happening to our tensors in real time. So let's get to it. Last time, we went through the process of writing the code to pre-process images for VGG16. Through that process, we gained exposure to working with tensors, transforming, and manipulating them. We're now going to step through these tensor operations with the debugger so that we can see these transformations occur in real time as we interact with our app. If you're not already familiar with using a debugger, don't worry, you'll still be able to follow. We'll first go through this process using the debugger in Visual Studio Code, then we'll demo the same process using the debugger built into the Chrome browser. We're here within our predict.js file within the click event for the predict button where all the preprocessing code is written. We're placing a breakpoint in our code where our first tensor is defined. Remember, this is where we're getting the selected image and transforming it into a tensor using tf.fromPixels. The expectation around this breakpoint is when we browse to our app, the model will load, we'll select an image, and click the predict button. Once we click predict, this click event will be triggered and we'll hit this breakpoint. When this happens, the code execution will be paused until we tell it to continue to the next step. This means that while we're paused, we can inspect the tensors we're working with and see how they look before and after any given operation. Let's see. We'll start our debugger in the top left of the window, which will launch our app in Chrome. All right, we can see our model is loading. Okay, the model's loaded. Let's select an image. Now let's click the predict button. And when we do this, we'll see our breakpoint will get hit and the app will pause. And here we go. Our code execution is now paused. We'll minimize the browser and expand our code window now since this is where we'll be debugging. We're currently paused at this line where we define our tensor object. We're going to click this step over icon, which will execute this code where we're defining tensor and we'll pause at the next step. Let's see. All right, we're now paused at the next step. Now that tensor has been defined, let's inspect it a bit. First, we have this variables panel over in the left where we can check out information about the variables in our app. And we can see our tensor variable is here in this list. Clicking tensor, we can see we have all types of information about this object. For example, we can see the D type is float32, the tensor is of rank 3, the shape is 224 by 224 by 3, and the size is 150,528. So we get a lot of information describing this guy. Additionally, in the debug console, we can play with this tensor further. For example, let's print it using the TensorFlow.js print function. And we'll scroll up a bit, and we can see that this kind of lets us get a summary of the data contained in this tensor. Remember, we made this tensor have shape 224 by 224 by 3. So looking at this output, we can visualize this tensor as an object with 224 rows, each of which is 224 pixels across, and each of those pixels contains a red, green, and blue value. So what's selected here represents one of those 224 rows, and each one of these are one of the 224 pixels in this row. And each of these pixels contains first a red, then a green, then a blue value. So make sure you have a good grip on this idea so you can follow all the transformations this tensor is about to go through. All right, our debugger is paused on defining the mean ImageNet RGB object. Let's go ahead and step over this so that it gets defined. Again, we can now inspect this object over in the local variables panel. 
we're not doing any tensor operations here, so let's go ahead and move on. We're now paused on our list of rank 1 tensors called indices, which we'll make use of later, so let's execute this. We can see indices now shows up in our local variable panel. Let's inspect this one a bit from the debug console. If we just print out this list using console.log indices, we get back that this is an array with three things in it. We know that each element in this array is a tensor, so let's access one of them. Let's get the first tensor. And it might help if we spell indices correctly, so let's try that again. We get back that this object is a tensor, and we can see what it looks like. Just a one-dimensional tensor with a single value zero. And we can easily do the same thing for the second and third elements in the list too. Alright, we're going to minimize this panel on the left now and scroll up some in our code. We're now paused where we're defining the centered RGB object, and from last time we know that's where the bulk of our tensor operations are occurring. So if we execute this block, then we'll skip over being able to inspect each of these transformations. So what we'll do is we'll stay paused here, but in the debugger console, we'll mimic each of these individual transformations one by one so we can see the before and after version of the tensor. So for example, we're first going to mimic what's happening here with the creation of the tensor that contains all the centered red values within our centered RGB object. In the console, we'll create this variable called red and set it equal to just the first call to tf.gather and see what it looks like. So we'll go ahead and copy this call and we'll create a variable red and set it equal to that. Before we do any other operations, let's see what this looks like. Let's first check the shape of red. Okay, 224 by 224 by 1. So similar to what we saw from the original tensor of 224 by 224 by 3, but rather than the last dimension containing all three pixel values, red, green, and blue, our new red tensor only contains the red pixel values. Let's print red, and let's scroll up so that we can see the start of the tensor. And just to hit the point home, let's compare this to the original tensor. So the first three values in red are 56, 58, and 59. Now let's scroll up and check out the original tensor to see if this lines up. So 56, 58, 59, scrolling up to our original tensor, and yep, our original tensor has the red values of 56, 58, and 59 in the first three zeroth indices along the second axis. So red is just made up of each of these values. All right, let's scroll back down in our debug console, and let's see what the next operation on red is. This is where we're centering each red value by subtracting the mean red value from ImageNet using the sub function. Let's make a new variable called centered red and mimic this operation. So we'll define centered red equal to red and then call the sub function. Now let's print centered red and scroll up to the top. Okay, so about minus 67, minus 65, and minus 64 for the first three values along the second axis. Let's compare this to the original red tensor now by scrolling up to look at that. And these are 56, 58, and 59 as the first three values along the second axis. So if we do the quick math of subtracting the mean red value of 123.68, and remember we can see that by looking here, 123.68 as our mean red value in the mean ImageNet RGB object. Subtracting this number from the first three values of our original red tensor, we do indeed end up with the centered red values in the new centered red tensor we just looked at. Now, centered red still has the same shape as red, which recall is 224 by 224 by 1. The next step is to reshape this tensor to be a rank 1 tensor of size 50,176. So we just want to bring all the centered red values together, which are currently each residing in their own individual tensors. So to mimic this reshape call, we'll make a new variable called reshaped red. So we'll scroll back down in our debugger console, and we'll copy this reshape call, and we'll define reshaped red equal to centered red, and then call reshape on that. All right, let's check the shape on this new object to get confirmation. 
and we see it is indeed the shape that we specified. Let's now look at the printout of reshaped red. Okay, and we see all the red values are now listed out here in this one dimensional tensor. All right, so that's it for getting all the centered red values. As mentioned last time, we go through the same process to gather all the blues and greens as well, so we're not going to go through that in the debugger. We'll now execute this block of code to create this centered RGB object and move on to the next step. This is where we're bringing our centered red, green, and blue values all together into a new processed tensor. So from the console, let's run this first stack operation by creating a variable called stacked tensor. So I'll create stacked tensor, set that equal to this stack call. Remember, we just saw that reshaped red ended up being a rank one tensor of shape 50,176. The green and blue tensors have the same shape and size. So when we stack them along axis one, we should now have a 50,176 by three tensor. You may think the result of the stack operation would look like this, where we have the centered red tensor with its 50,176 values stacked on top of the green tensor stacked on top of the blue tensor. And that's how it would look if we were stacking along axis zero. Because we're stacking along axis one though, we'll get something that looks like this, where we have 50,176 rows, each of which is made up of a single pixel with a red, green, and blue value. Let's check the shape now in the console to be sure we get the 50,176 by three we expect. Yep, we do. Let's also print it to get a visual. Okay, so we have 50,176 rows, each containing a red, green, and blue value. Now we need to reshape this guy to be of shape 224 by 224 by three before we can pass it to the model. So let's do that now with a new variable we'll call reshaped tensor. So we'll copy the reshape call from over here and define reshaped tensor equal to our stacked tensor dot reshape. Okay, let's print this reshape tensor and scroll up to the top. Again, this shape means we have 224 rows, each containing 224 pixels, which each contain a red, green, and blue value. Now we need to reverse the values in this tensor along the second axis from RGB to BGR for the reasons we mentioned last time. So we'll copy this reverse call here and we'll make a new object called reversed tensor and set that equal to our reshape tensor dot reverse. And we need to scroll down in our debug console and let's print this one out and scroll up to the top of it. Okay, so we see the first BGR values. Now let's scroll up to our last tensor to make sure this is the reverse of the RGB values we had there. So minus 99, minus 87, minus 67, scrolling up, we have minus 99, minus 87, minus 67. So indeed our new tensor has the reversed RGB values. Let's scroll back down in our debugger. And our last operation is expanding the dimensions of our tensor to make it go from rank three to a rank four tensor, which is what our model requires. So we'll create a new tensor called expanded tensor and set that equal to reverse tensor. And we'll copy the expand dim call from over here and call that on our reverse tensor. All right, now let's check the shape of this guy to make sure it's what we expect. So we have this inserted dimension at the start now, making our tensor rank four with shape one by 224 by 224 by three, rather than just 224 by 224 by three that we had last time. And if we print this out and scroll up to the start, we can see this extra dimension added around our previous tensor. And that sums up all the tensor operations. Quickly though, in case you're not using Visual Studio Code, I did want to also show this same setup directly within the Chrome browser so that you can do your debugging there instead if you'd prefer. In Chrome, we can right click on our page, click inspect, and then go to the sources tab. Here we have access to the source code for our app. 
PredictJS is currently being shown in the open window, so now we have access to the exact code we were displaying in Visual Studio Code. And we can insert breakpoints here in the same way as well. Let's go ahead and put a breakpoint in the same place as we did earlier. Now let's select an image and click the Predict button. We see that our app is paused at our breakpoint, and then we can step over the code just as we saw earlier. And we have our variables all showing in this panel here. And we also have our console down here. So I can do indices 0.print, for example, to get that same output that we got in Visual Studio Debugger. And from this console, I can run all the same code that we ran in Visual Studio Code as well. All right, hopefully now you have a decent grasp on tensors and tensor operations. Let me know what you thought of going through this practice in the debugger to see how the tensors changed over time with each operation. And I'll see you in the next section. In this section, we'll learn about broadcasting and illustrate its importance and major convenience when it comes to tensor operations. So let's get to it. Over the last couple of sections, we've immersed ourselves in tensors, and hopefully now we have a good understanding of how to work with, transform, and operate on them. If you recall, a couple sections back, I mentioned the term broadcasting and said that we would later make use of it to vastly simplify our VGG16 pre-processing code. Before we get into the details about what broadcasting is, though, let's get a sneak peek of what our transform code will look like once we've introduced broadcasting. Because I'm using git for source management, I can see the diff between our original predict.js file and the modified version of this file that uses broadcasting. On the left, we have our original predict.js file. Within the click event, recall this is where we transformed our image into a tensor. Then the rest of this code was all created to do the appropriate pre-processing for VGG16, where we centered and reversed the RGB values. Now, on the right, this is our new and improved PredictJS file that makes use of broadcasting in place of all the explicit one-by-one -one tensor operations on the left. So look, all of this code in red has now been replaced with what's shown in green. That's a pretty massive reduction of code. Before we show how this happened, we need to understand what broadcasting is. Broadcasting describes how tensors with different shapes are treated during arithmetic operations. For example, it might be relatively easy to look at these two rank two tensors and figure out what the sum of them would be. They have the same shape, so we just take the element-wise sum of the two tensors where we calculate the sum element by element, and here we go, we have our resulting tensor. Now, since these two tensors have the same shape, one by three, no broadcasting is happening here. Remember, broadcasting comes into play when we have tensors with different shapes. All right, so what would happen if our two rank two tensors instead looked like this and we wanted to sum them? We have one with shape one by three and the other with shape three by one. Well, here's where broadcasting will come into play. Before we cover how this is done, go ahead and pause the video and just see intuitively what comes to mind as the resulting tensor from adding these two together. Give it a go, write it down, and keep what you write handy because we'll circle back around to what you wrote later in the video. All right, we're first going to look at the result and then we'll go over how we arrive there. Our result from summing these two tensors is a three by three tensor. So here's how broadcasting works. We have two tensors with different shapes. The goal of broadcasting is to make the tensors have the same shape so we can perform element-wise operations on them. First, we have to see if the operation we're trying to do is even possible between the given tensors. Based on the tensor's original shapes, there may not be a way to reshape them to force them to be compatible. And if we can't do that, then we can't use broadcasting. The rule to see if broadcasting can be used is this. We compare the shapes of the two tensors, starting at their last dimensions and working backwards. Our goal is to determine whether or not each dimension between the two tensor shapes is compatible. In our example, we have shapes three by one and one by three. So we first compare the last dimensions. The dimensions are compatible when either A, they're equal to each other, or B, one of them is one. Comparing the last dimensions of the two shapes, we have a one and a three. Are these compatible? Well, let's check the rule. 
Are they equal? No, one doesn't equal three. Is one of them one? Yes. Great, the last dimensions are compatible. Working our way to the front, for the next dimension, we have a three and a one. Similar story, just switched order, right? So are these compatible? Yes. Okay, that's the first step. We've confirmed each dimension between the two shapes is compatible. If, however, while comparing the dimensions, we confirm that at least one dimension wasn't compatible, then we would cease our efforts there because the arithmetic would not be possible between the two. Now, since we've confirmed that our two tensors are compatible, we can sum them and use broadcasting to do it. When we sum two tensors, the result of this sum will be a new tensor. Our next step is to find out the shape of this resulting tensor. We do that by, again, comparing the shapes of the original tensors. Let's see exactly how this is done. Comparing the shape of 1 by 3 to 3 by 1, we first calculate the max of the last dimension. The max of 3 and 1 is 3. 3 will be the last dimension of the shape of the resulting tensor. Moving on to the next dimension. Again, the max of 1 and 3 is 3. So 3 will be the next dimension of the shape of the resulting tensor. We've now stepped through each dimension of the shapes of the original tensors, and we can conclude that the resulting tensor will have shape 3x3. Three three. The original tensors of shape 1x3 and 3x1 will now be expanded to shape 3x3 three three also in order to do the element-wise operation. Broadcasting can be thought of as copying the existing values within the original tensor and expanding that tensor with these copies until it reaches the required shape. The values in our 1 by 3 tensor will now be broadcast to this 3 by 3 tensor. And the values in our 3 by 1 tensor will now be broadcast to this 3 by 3 tensor. We can now easily take the element-wise sum of these two to get this resulting 3 by 3 tensor. Let's do another example. What if we wanted to multiply this rank 2 tensor of shape 1 by 3 with this rank 0 tensor, better known as a scalar, we can do this since there's nothing in the broadcasting rules preventing us from operating on two tensors of different ranks. Let's see. We first compare the last dimensions of the two shapes. When we're in a situation where the ranks of the two tensors aren't the same, like what we have here, then we simply substitute a 1 in for the missing dimensions of the lower ranked tensor. In our example, we substitute a 1 here. Then we ask, are these two dimensions compatible? And the answer will always be a yes in this type of situation, since one of them will always be a 1. Alright, all the dimensions are compatible. So what will the resulting tensor look like from multiplying these two together? Again, go ahead and pause here and try yourself before getting the answer. Well, the max of 3 and 1 is 3, and the max of 1 and 1 is 1. So our resulting tensor will be of shape 1 by 3. Our first tensor is already this shape, so it gets left alone. Our second tensor is now expanded to this shape by broadcasting its value like this. Now we can do our element-wise multiplication to get this resulting 1 by 3 tensor. Let's do one more example. What if we wanted to sum this rank 3 tensor of shape 1 by 2 by 3 and this rank 2 tensor of shape 3 by 3? Before covering any of the incremental steps, go ahead and give it a shot yourself and see what you find out. Alright, assuming you've now paused and resumed the video, the deal with these two tensors is that we can't operate on them. Why? Well, comparing the second to last dimensions of the shapes, they're not equal to each other and neither one of them is one. So we stop there. Alright, now we should have a good grip on broadcasting. Let's go see how we're able to make use of it in our VGG16 preprocessing code. First, we can see we're changing our mean image net RGB object into a rank one tensor which makes sense, right? Because we're going to be making use of broadcasting, which is going to require us to work with tensors, not arbitrary JavaScript objects. All right, now get a load of this remaining code. All of this code was written to handle the centering of the RGB values. This has now all been replaced with this single line, which is simply the result of subtracting the mean image net RGB tensor from the original tensor. Okay, so why does this work and where is the broadcasting? Let's see. Our original tensor is a rank 3 tensor of shape 224 by 224 by 3. Our mean ImageNet RGB tensor is a rank 1 tensor of shape 3. 
Our objective is to subtract each mean RGB value from each RGB value along the second axis of the original tensor. From what we've learned about broadcasting, we can do this really easily. We can pair the dimensions of the shapes from each tensor and confirm they're compatible. The last dimensions are compatible because they're equal to each other. The next two dimensions are compatible because we substitute a 1 in for the missing dimensions in our rank 1 tensor. Taking the max across each dimension, our resulting tensor will be of shape 224 by 224 by 3. Our original tensor already has that shape, so we leave it alone. Our rank 1 tensor will be expanded to this shape of 224 by 224 by 3 by copying its three values along the second axis. So now we can easily do the element-wise subtraction between these two tensors. Exiting out of this diff and looking at the modified predict.js file alone, we have this. So the reversing and the expanding of the dims at the end is still occurring in the same way after the centering. Now actually, if we wanted to make this code even more concise, rather than creating two tensor objects, our original one and our preprocessed one, we can chain all these calls together to condense these two separate tensors into one. We would first need to bring our mean ImageNet RGB definition above our tensor definition. Then we need to move our sub, reverse, and expand dim calls up and chain them to the original tensor. Lastly, we replace this reference to process tensor with just tensor, and that's it. So if you took the time to truly understand the tensor operations we went through step by step in the last couple of sections, then you should now be pretty blown away by how much easier broadcasting can make our lives and our code. Given this, do you see the value in broadcasting? Let me know in the comments. Oh, also remember all those times I asked you to pause the video and record your answers to the examples we were going through? Let me know what you got. And don't be embarrassed if you were wrong. I was wrong when I tried to figure out examples like these when I first started learning broadcasting, so no shame. Let me know and I'll see you in the next section. In this section, we'll be adding new functionality to our deep learning web application to increase its speed and performance. Specifically, we'll see how we can do this by switching models. So let's get to it. We currently have a web app that allows users to select and submit an image and subsequently receive a prediction for the given image. Up to this point, we've been using VGG16 as our model. VGG16 gets the job done when it comes to giving accurate predictions on the submitted images, However, as we've previously discussed, a model of its size, over 500 megabytes, is not ideal for running in the browser. Because of this, we've seen a decent time delay in both loading the model as well as obtaining predictions from the model. Well, we're in luck because we'll now make use of a much smaller model, MobileNet, which is pretty ideal size-wise for running in the browser, coming in at around 16 megabytes. With MobileNet, we'll see a vast decrease in time for both loading the model and obtaining predictions. Let's go ahead and get into the code to see what modifications we need to make. All right, we're here in our predict with TFJS HTML file, and we're going to make a model selector where the user has the ability to choose which model to use. For now, we'll have VGG16 and MobileNet as available options. Currently, the call to load the model occurs immediately when the web page is requested, but now we'll change that functionality so that the model will be loaded once a user selects which model they'd like to use. Our model selector will take on the form of an HTML select element. So the first thing we need to do is add this element to our HTML. Within the same row as the image selector and the predict button, we're adding this new select element within a column to the left of both of the previously mentioned elements. When a user shows up to the page, the model selector will be set to the option that states select model, and they'll have the option to choose either MobileNet or VGG16. Now also recall how we mentioned that until now, the model was being loaded immediately when a user arrived at the page, and during that time the progress bar would show to indicate the loading. Since we'll be changing the functionality so that the model isn't loaded until a user chooses which model they want to use, we won't need the progress bar to show until that model is selected. So navigating to the progress bar element, we're going to set the display style attribute to none, which will hide the progress bar until we explicitly instruct it to be shown in the JavaScript code. All right, that's it for the changes to our HTML. Jumping to predict.js, we'll now specify what should happen once a user selects a model. When a model is selected, this will trigger a change event on the model selector. We're handling this event by calling a new function, which we'll discuss in a moment, called loadModel. LoadModel essentially does what it sounds like it does. 
We pass this function the value from model selector, which is either going to be MobileNet or VGG16. Do you remember how previously we were loading the model using an immediately invoked function expression, or IIFE? Well, now that we don't want to load the model until we explicitly call load model, like we just specified, we no longer want this loading to happen within an IIFE. The code for load model is actually super similar to the IIFE we had before, just with some minor adjustments. Load model accepts the name of the model to be loaded. Once called, the progress bar will be shown to indicate the model is loading. We initially set the model to undefined so that in case we're in a situation where we're switching from one model to another, the previous model can be cleared from memory. Afterwards, we set model to the result of calling the TensorFlow.js function tf.loadmodel. Remember, this function accepts the URL to the given model's model.json file. The models reside in folders that were given the names of the actual models themselves. For example, the vgg16 files reside within a directory called vgg16 and the MobileNet files reside within a directory called MobileNet. So when we give the URL to the model.json, we use the name of the selected model to point to the correct location for where the corresponding JSON file resides. Once the model is loaded, we then hide the progress bar. All right, now let's navigate to the click event for the predict button. Previously, within this handler function, we would get the selected image, and then we would do all of the pre-processing for VGG16 and get a prediction. Well, now since we have two different models that preprocess images differently, we're putting the preprocessing code into its own function called preprocess image. So now, once a user clicks the predict button, we get the selected image, we get the model name from the value of the model selector, and then we create a tensor, which is set to the result of our new preprocess image function. We pass the function both the image and the model name. Let's go check out this function. All right, as just touched on, preprocess image accepts an image and the model name. It then creates a tensor using tf.fromPixels, passing the given image to it, resizes this tensor to have height and width dimensions of 224 by 224, and casts the tensor's type to float. All of this should look really familiar because we had this exact same code within the predict button's click event before. This code won't change regardless of whether we're using VGG16 or MobileNet. Now, in case later we want to add another model, and say we only want the base generic preprocessing that we just covered, then in that case we won't pass a model name, and we'll catch that case with this if statement that just returns the tensor with expanded dimensions. If VGG16 is the selected model, then we need to do the remaining preprocessing that we went over together in earlier sections. So we have our mean ImageNet RGB tensor that we defined last time here and we subtract the mean ImageNet RGB tensor from the original tensor, reverse the RGB values, and expand the dimensions of the tensor. We then return this final tensor as the result of this function. If MobileNet is selected on the other hand, then our preprocessing will be a bit different. Unlike VGG16, the images that MobileNet was originally trained on were preprocessed so that the RGB values were scaled down from a scale of 0 to 255 to a scale of minus 1 to 1. We do this by first creating this scalar value of 127.5, which is exactly one half of 255. We then subtract the scalar from the original tensor and divide that result by the scalar. This will put all the values on a scale of minus one to one. Notice the use of broadcasting that's going on with these operations behind the scenes. Lastly, we again expand the dimensions and then return this resulting tensor. Also, in this last case, if a model name is passed to this function that isn't one of the available ones already here, then we'll throw this exception. All right, we've made all the necessary code changes. Let's now browse to our app and see the results. We've arrived at our application, and we now have the new model selector we added in. Clicking on the selector, we can select either MobileNet or VGG16. Let's go ahead and select MobileNet. And you can see that loaded pretty fast. Remember when we loaded VGG16 in previous sections, I had to pause and resume the video since it took so long to load, but MobileNet was speedy. All right, cool. Now we'll select an image, click predict, and again, MobileNet was super fast relative to VGG16 and returning a prediction to us. So hopefully this exercise has illustrated the practicality of using mobile nets in situations like these. And that's it. Congratulations for making it all the way to the end. Give yourself a pat on the back. If you're looking to learn more, be sure to check out Deep Lizard on YouTube and the available resources on deeplizard.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you later.